It's no secret that I've been wanting to install water methanol injection on this car. You may have noticed this water methanol kit that's been trolling around in the background of several of my other videos, and a few astute viewers have picked up on that. This is the AEM Universal Water Methanol Kit. The first thing that you should do before you begin is read your installation instructions cover to cover and be sure you understand them. If you have a problem with doing this, just put it in your bathroom, it'll get read eventually. If you have kids, it might even get flushed. Included in this kit, you get a long length of push lock poly hose, a slightly shorter length of silicone vacuum hose. Is that silicone? Sure, it looks like it. A slightly shorter length still of some convoluted tubing for the interior harness, the water methanol controller with about 10 feet of wiring harness, and some type of rubber gasket thing, and I'll, I'll figure out what this is later. The water methanol injector with three different size nozzles for different horsepower goals, and this type has an internal check valve built into it to prevent backflow. So let's take a closer look at that controller real quick. There's four things on the thing. Test, start flow pressure, and max flow pressure dials, and an error light. All the error codes and references and short descriptions for what all the wire colors are for are printed right on the controller box. Also included are crimp connectors, zip ties, and a bag of hardware that AEM thinks that you'll use to install this kit. Now, the reason I wanted to use this kit was because of the kind of pump that it included. This is a 200 PSI variable flow pump with an internal bypass. It offers a more even and predictable flow rate because it doesn't pulse like the older pumps do. And of course, last but not least, there's the water methanol tank complete with a low fluid sensor, airtight cap, and a swiveling push lock connector output to connect it to the pump. Don't ever attempt to tighten that fitting on the bottom of the tank. It has a methanol safe sealant applied to the threads and it'll create a permanent leak if you do. First thing you wanna do is figure out where to put everything. It's pretty obvious that over time, my engine bay has only grown more crowded. The front fender wells are filled with intercooler pipes. It's really obvious that there's no room left anywhere in this engine bay to fit this thing. This leaves me with no choice but to install the kit somewhere inside the car's interior. But first, before I begin, I wanted to go drag racing again to play with launch control. And my last video's passes were made without the passenger side headlight in it that blocks the air filter. This is the air filter I bought back in 2004 for my GSX. The air filter that everyone's been begging me to replace. You mean they're not supposed to last 14? years? So yeah, why not? Daggone it, I screwed up. This filter's bigger. The length is right, but the diameter might be a problem for me. My old filter touched the headlight and might be too big to put the headlight back in. It's not too big to race with though, so I'm putting it back in right now and going racing. Since the video is about water methanol injection, I put the drag pass up on Patreon for the generous people who are invested in my progress. Occasionally I'll do this. My channel has a plot, and sometimes before the next chapter begins here on YouTube, I might shoot something else that's on topic with the last video, or find an old video or something that's relevant to my work where maybe I'm not proud of the footage or it doesn't follow the channel's plot. I don't do it often because the main channel's videos take so many resources for production and that's what my patrons are really trying to help me with in the first place. I offer no apologies about this because those videos take time to produce as well. My sponsors on Patreon are how I've managed to stay in all of your feeds, so tell them thank you when you see them. But anyway, I'm back now. Had a blast. Back to water injection. After walking around and scratching my head for a while about where everything's going to go, I decided the included fastener kit was mostly useless for me. There are a lot of holes for mounting all the parts, and I didn't see the fasteners that were long enough or plentiful enough to use all the holes. So I went to the hardware store and bought all the fasteners for about 20 bucks so I could use all the holes. You gotta pay extra if you want to use all the holes. I think I figured out some scrap pieces of steel that were laying around inside my garage that will work for mounting the tank and the pump. Of course, what else would I do? Some of them you'll recognize from other videos, and I also bought an AEM micro relay and this socket kit because I want to improve the functionality of the failsafe circuit with my car's modifications. Just be advised that if you want to make use of this kit's built-in failsafe feature that you'll need to buy other stuff to go with it. It wasn't bad, it's like 20 bucks. The instructions made a whole lot of hoo-ha about installing a dash-mountable LED as if it was included, and it's not. So I bought one of those too for like seven bucks. At least the instructions in the controller box include all the things to help you buy and install one. You don't have to have it because the controller box has an error light on it, but I wanted one. There was foreshadowing about this installation in the last video regarding where I'm going to put it, but I need it because the controller box is not going to be visible from where I'm installing it. Let's take a look at that location, shall we? This is like the most awesomer's frig place to ever think about adding some kind of controller box. I've got a daggone driver's side glove box thing.
thing with a neato cover that locks itself with a touch. I always put my wideband O2 gauge in there before, but I'm really glad I didn't now. I've never owned a car that had one of these things, so naturally I don't use it for anything at all. I mean, what else? What I do with it, it's not even big enough for one glove. Taking it out is easy. There's just one screw and some clips that hold it in. The dimmer switch is on here. And while taking this thing apart, I encounter yet another annoyance of something I've been meaning to improve for a long time. The dang boost gauge wires are just crammed in the back of the dimmer switch. I mean, I'm cool with how it was installed. It, I, it never had a problem, never shorted out on me or anything. But what really is a problem is the boost gauge itself. Look at what I'm doing here. The button changes color on the gauge face. And it has several to choose from. But every single time you turn the headlights off and back on again, the boost gauge is now green. It resets. It goes back to it. It doesn't remember where you left it. The gauge face color is really a stupid problem to have, and I know it's just an installation problem that I could easily fix, but there's something that you might not know about me. I hate boost gauges. I think they're a complete waste of money. I went through a phase where I thought they were important, but they're not. The minute you install a map sensor into your engine management system that lets you log your boost, a boost gauge becomes useless and irrelevant. First, you never look at the thing while you're driving. Second, you'll never remember precisely how much boost you had at any given RPM or at every given RPM at whatever speed or gear or anything else while you're looking at your logs. Next, you should have a pressure gauge on your boost leak tester or a regulated air supply for boost leak testing. You don't boost leak test from the driver's seat. Boost gauges add clutter to the interior, but the absolute worst thing about this boost gauge is that it obstructs the check engine light from my view, making me have to lean sideways to drive on the track so I can watch the check engine light for knock warnings. What good is a boost gauge if it makes me miss my warning light and toast my engine? I log boost. It makes for much easier couch tuning. I have warning lights that I want to see here that are a thousand times more important than a boost gauge. So goodbye boost gauge, you will not be missed. I just twisted the boost gauge off the steering wheel bezel. Apparently some kind of construction adhesive was used to just stick it down and I'll have to figure out how to get that off later if I care about it. The only thing this boost gauge is useful for to me is that there's already a vacuum hose pulled right here to this location that I can plug the controller box into. Man, that was really convenient. It needs a boost source. That's a huge time saver. So anyway, let's cut a hole in this thing for all the stuff on the controller box to fit through. Now, I don't want to butcher this thing, so I figured I'd start with a small hole using a cutting disc and then slowly make the hole bigger with less aggressive tools as necessary. This is the side that the dimmer switch goes on, so I have to think about where the wires and cables are going to fit here and inside the dash. It's a trial and error process. It requires some fitting and testing to get the fit right. Using an adhesive on the boost gauge sort of gave me an idea to use one to mount the controller box. I mean, why not? It's feather light, flat, smooth, doesn't make sense to use screws, and I couldn't get a screwdriver in here if I wanted to. On the dashboard side of things, there's a chunk of plastic that kind of interferes with the things coming out of the controller that line, you know, where that lines up. A quick pass of the double cut carbide burr made plenty of room for what I've got protruding from that bezel. Problem solved. Now let's see how this thing fits. Man, that looks great. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, okay, it's held in with one screw. I can't cheat here. I taped the dang box down, but that was a mistake. At least doing it in that order was a mistake anyway. It's blocking the hole for the screw, so I can't secure the bezel onto the dash. I should have paid better attention to that. I guess I need to complete the rest of the install first and then tape it down. According to the instructions, some of the wires attached to the controller box connect to the pump and to the reservoir, and some of them need to go inside the dash near the front of the car. After I figure out what everything is, I separated the wires into two separate bundles and installed convoluted tubing on both runs of the wires. The short section included in the kit I'm using for the short dashboard run. And I happen to have a ton of this convoluted tubing stuff left over from the earlier wiring harness work on this car, and I'm going to use that to cover up the long run to the back of the car. Fortunately, the convoluted tubing they included fits the same profile as the stuff that I already have. What you do here, where it forks, is you just put the two sections of convoluted tubing with the slotted sides facing each other. Just before the junction, wrap one of them all the way around the other and press the convoluted tubing's grooves into the pieces adjacent to it. Tape the outside of that joint. Go about an inch down the joint before the junction and then tape around each leg of the junction and then back up onto itself. Voila! Neat and tidy harness junction. 
Who cares though? Let's go fit this thing back into the dash and run the wires where they belong. In order to route them where they need to go, I first need to remove the kick panel. We've been in here before, back when we installed the wideband sensor, so it's probably familiar to most of you. The kick panel is backed in styrofoam, and it's sort of obstructing where these wires go their separate ways, so I used a razor knife to trim a channel out of it so as not to chafe the harness or put any pressure on it. Next, I ran the harness through the dash, cut the old end of the vacuum hose off to make a clean connection to the controller box, plugged in the vacuum line, and popped the bezel in. Put the screw in, put a new piece of double sticky tape on the controller box, but I didn't peel it off yet. And I'm going to change up the program here a little bit. This green wire is the fail-safe wire from the controller. It pulls ground when active. I want that inside the dash nearish to the ECU. We'll come back to that when we go into advanced mode later. Moving on, before I can pull the rest of the wires through the dash, I have to pull everything I just did in the last video right back out again, while giving myself a big pat on the back for not having to mess with the stereo and using bullet connectors so I can easily remove everything. If you're your own mechanic, do your repairs and modifications in a way that makes them easy for you to work on. It's worth the effort. With all that stuff out of the way, I pulled the dash connectors to the gauge hole and the pump and tank wires through the center console to the back seat underneath the carpet. With the back seat and door trim molding removed, it's easy to pull the wires to the trunk of the car, unseen. Small problem though, I think they're too short. Should be easy enough to fix. I made a mess. We've got a debris problem on the set. Fixed. Might as well put the center console back in because we're done pulling wires. Stay tuned later for when we pull hoses. I'm oh, sorry about that. Had to kill the mic there for a second. That is actually a part of this job, and I'm not looking forward to it either. I have to put this tank in here somewhere where it will be easy to fill, where it won't interfere with the trunk hinge, and in a place where it won't get damaged if anything ever starts flopping around back here. I intend to make a mount for it that won't let anything flop around back here or get damaged, and it's going to probably end up matching the engineering style of the battery tray. I really don't feel like explaining it. You know what all this stuff is already? This sounds like a perfect excuse to drop a fabrication sequence steeped in Rojo del Chocolate sauce.
so that takes care of the vast majority of fabrication for this video and I'm happy with what I've put together here. Now it's time to move on to the wiring portion of this install. The first problem I have to overcome is the wiring harness on the controller is not long enough to reach all the stuff that it needs to connect to. So first I have to add some extensions to bridge that gap. The wires that power the pump are 10 gauge, so I used an 8 gauge wire for the run to the battery positive connection. I used a black 12 gauge wire to extend both the black wires coming from the fluid level sensor because that's what I had. With that sorted out, I carefully wrapped up both legs of these circuits in convoluted tubing to keep things nice and tidy. Oh, and I installed the low pressure feeder hose from the tank to the pump. Just because. Because why not? The next thing we have to do is bolt the stuff down to the thing. I only use two bolts for this because why complicate things? They're 3 8 inch bolts and each bolt requires more than 800 pounds of force to cause a failure. Should be enough. They'll rip through the floor pan before they ever see that kind of load, so... There's two harnesses that I need to put together back here. Looks pretty innocent and easy, all wrapped up like that. I wish I could just leave them that way, but they're not going to install themselves and I don't have an intern, so I guess I have to be the one to make sense of all this. The fluid level sensor. It's a float switch, so it's either on or off. Polarity doesn't matter for this. The brown and white wires from the controller connect to the wires I extended from the float switch. The orange wire is the pump controller wire. Basically, it's just a variable resistance ground. I used a spare 12 gauge red wire to connect the orange wire to the black wire on the pump. All you need to know is that the orange wire connects to the black pump wire. The red wire. Okay, it's complicated. At least it is in my video. There's only supposed to be two red wires in this kit. The controller and the pump red wires are both supposed to connect to battery positive. Why make an extra splice on a DC power circuit when I can jack this sucker in right here to this 8 gauge pump extension that's already going to the same place? I don't like doing it this way, but all these wires are connected to the same modification, so I don't mind. I could run these all the way to the front of the car where the battery is, or I could just connect them right back here to this big zero gauge run that's already doing that for me. Also in the wire bundle I pulled back here is the ground wire. It's only one measly 14 gauge wire and I don't know how it does it. How it grounds the pump, the controller, the LED, the relay, and its own built-in map sensor all off of this one tiny 14 gauge wire. I extended it with some 12 gauge, put a ring terminal on it, and bolted it down to the same ground where my fuel pump connects. Then I put a ring terminal on the power wire and nutted it down to the circuit breaker that's feeding my fuel pump. If the fuel pump has power and ground, then so does the water methanol kit. That's the way you want it. In an earlier video, I installed relays to switch power on to all my gauges and accessory outlets. I'm out of power outlets from my previous work, so I'm having to make a three-way splitter to handle the additional power connections up front with this water methanol kit. One of them is needed to connect to the dash LED, which I may need to disconnect if I ever need to work inside the dashboard. Another is needed for the system activation, and also a power wire to the relay that you saw me unbox earlier. The third leg plugs into my autometer gauges. The blue wire from the controller is a 5 volt output that you can connect to a data logger input. I have no need for this because I have a wideband oxygen sensor, and what my wideband sensor reads is all the data I care about for making adjustments. But I'm cutting it off and using this as a power wire for the failsafe mode relay that I'll be installing shortly. On the other end of the blue, formerly controller but now power relay wire, I'm crimping both it and the yellow activation wire together in one male bullet connector. I should never need to disconnect these, but I can. I will need to disconnect that LED from time to time. Before I go further, I need to install the warning slash duty cycle LED into the gauge plate that I made in the previous video. I took this thing back out of the bezel to avoid breaking anything while I work. This plastic's really fragile. I didn't feel like I needed to remove the gauges to drill this thing out though. I punched a 5 16 inch hole, and there's a handy knurled nut included for the back of this thing that makes honking it down tight a cinch. Next, I put bullet connectors on the leads for the LED, and finished off my mess with some convoluted tubing again. Man, I've got bags of this stuff, maybe I just need to use it up or something. And here it is after putting it all back together. Man, I love the look of the status LED here, it's so stealth. It's just a blue LED, and it's practically invisible when it's off, look at that. Now we're going to go into advanced mode. This is my favorite part of the install. I'm measuring the resistance across the pins of my boost control solenoid. On the 2000 ohm scale, I'm measuring 37, 36 ohms. There's just a coil in the boost control solenoid that actuates it. It's a 36 ohm coil. Hmm. I want to somehow match that for what I'm about to do. 
I don't have a 36 ohm resistor, but what I do have are several 220 ohm resistors. I figure if I attach six of these things to each other in parallel, I should come up with about that. All right, well, you see it there, 37 ohms. Why, Jaffro? Well, we'll get into that. Keep your pants on. I used a piece of carb cleaner straw as an insulated spacer because it was about the same thickness as a resistor. I put it in the middle of the six resistors and then I used a piece of shrink tubing to hold them all together in a tight geometric pattern. I put another piece of shrink tubing slightly larger around it to squeeze it together tighter. Next I cut a piece of 12 gauge wire, stripped it, and twisted the legs of the resistor around it. After twisting them tightly and soldering them to the wire, I just repeat the same steps on the other side. I know I'm going a little bit over the top here with the shrink tubing, but this is a power wire and a homemade inline 37 ohm resistor is a little bit weird. Normally these things are connected to a breadboard or soldered to a circuit board, but I don't think there's any reason why this won't work for what I need to do. Resistors are thermal devices, but there's six of these things in parallel, so it shouldn't get that hot. If they do, maybe it'll just make the shrink tubing tighter. I don't know. We'll find out. I'm essentially going to use a relay to make two different fuel delivery systems work together you absolutely must have a reliable failsafe on a car equipped with water methanol injection because it's a fuel system. It becomes part of your tune. So something has to save your engine if the water methanol system ever fails or runs out of juice. And it will. It will. It will do that in roughly four quart intervals. You can buy a bigger tank for it. A warning light isn't going to save your engine if the system runs dry. And methanol isn't something that you find at the corner store. If you have to plug in a laptop to tune it, well, if, if you don't have your laptop with you, then what happens when you run out of juice? It still won't save you at wide open throttle if it shuts off. There are a few ways to execute a failsafe system for water methanol injection setups, from pulling timing to cutting boost, but it's something that's often overlooked or ignored by the people who install them. I have no idea why, because I've seen the results firsthand what happens when you don't. Everyone's setup is a little bit different. Their tuning methods are different. And I believe that that's the reason that the relay isn't included. This is why I said earlier that you should read all of the instructions and understand them because it's you who must bridge that gap to make a working failsafe system. You've probably asked yourself why I'm doing this a half dozen times by now. The boost control solenoid on a first generation DSM gets its power from the exact same source as the ECU. They're on the same circuit. If you look at the schematics, you can confirm this. Here's the boost control solenoid circuit connected to the MPI relay power. The dots represent junctions, just to clarify where they are whenever these lines intersect other circuits. There's the boost control solenoid, and that's where it connects to the ECU at pin number 105. Here's the other circuit junctioned into the MPI relay power. You see it goes off the page as circuit number 1 to the next page. Circuit number one on the next page runs over to a junction and down to pin 102. The diagram for the ECU is clearly labeled power source. So both the ECU and the boost control solenoid are powered on the same circuit. The boost control solenoid is basically just a vacuum relay. That's all it is. The ECU controls the boost control solenoid based off of preset duty cycle routines. The factory boost control solenoid only has two vacuum ports, one for the boost source and one for the wastegate actuator. It can only bleed a small amount of air off to the atmosphere or suck a small amount of atmospheric air back in. It's not going to help you if you want to turn the boost up with the ECM link. It's useless for that. I installed an aftermarket three-port boost control solenoid that's made by Ingersoll Rand, and it adds a vacuum port into the mix with the boost source port and the wastegate ports to assist in holding the wastegate shut when the solenoid's active. It works with ECM links so that I can electronically set my boost to wherever I want it to be, limited of course by what my turbo is capable of producing. Essentially, it gave ECM Link electronic boost controller capabilities, but without some silly expensive piggyback box with blinky lights and complicated wiring. It plugs right into the factory harness with an elementary grade harness modification. You can set boost pressure duty cycles by gear, which is calculated with the help of your speed sensor, and it's just one of many reasons why ECM Link is so awesome. The relay I'm installing lets me hack the boost solenoid circuit, forcing a failure and putting me at wastegate pressure. I covered the basics of how relays work in a previous video. In fact, we're using that particular relay circuit to power the whole water methanol kit and the failsafe relay that I'm installing in this video. But we're using this micro relay a little bit differently this time around. 
we're adding a fifth leg to the circuit. We're going to use 87A this time. Relays are very versatile, but to recap, 30 is your constant, 85 is your coil ground, 86 is coil power. When the coil power is applied by a complete circuit at 85 and 86, the relay switches to its on position and connects your constant pin 30 to pin 87. When the relay is off, the constant switches back to 87A. The water methanol kit provides a green fail-safe ground wire that can pull up to 1.7 amps to ground to ground a circuit. The relay I'm using doesn't pull anywhere near that. Remember, I cut that blue wire off from the kit and connected it to a switched power source. The relay is powered at all times when the engine is running, but it stays in the off position, letting the ECU talk to the boost control solenoid normally and use whatever duty cycle I have it set for. If the water methanol kit senses a problem and pulls that green wire to ground, the relay activates and connects the constant pin to 87, which is the fake boost control solenoid's resistor pack. The ECU can scream, make boost, but nothing happens because a pile of resistors can't pull vacuum. There are three things I'm trying to solve by doing it this way. One being that opening the boost control solenoid circuit will put me at wastegate pressure no matter what the ECU duty cycle is saying to do. The second one being an open short in the boost control solenoid circuit to the ECU makes the ECU ask, where's my boost control solenoid? When it gets a dead circuit, it panics, throws a check engine light, and runs rich in limp mode. What this relay does is it switches power back to the ECU input and makes it think that it's still connected. And reason number three is because I want the same resistance on the fake circuit as the real circuit so that it doesn't create a voltage rise or drop to the ECU power pin whenever the relay switches between the real and the fake BCS signals. Maybe I'm crazy, but this seemed like a really good idea to me. Current follows the path of least resistance. I'm not giving it another place to escape. There should be no current change in current draw whenever it's in the on or off position, so there should be no change in the ECU's input power. Proof's in the pudding, though. I'm just wrapping up what you saw me demonstrate in the drawings. It feels good to have that part behind me now. All that's left is to plug in my connections for the water meth setup and the LED and my gauges, the backlighting, the 12 volt outlet, my switches, the clock, three screws, and the ashtray. I cleaned up the steering column thing with a spudger and the goop came right off without scratching it. But before I'm done, I need to modify the intake to accept the water methanol nozzle. Because my intercooler pipe is just thin wall aluminum, I can't easily complete this install myself. I can drill it, sure, but I'll have to get a bung welded onto it and I can't do that. I don't want whoever helps with this to have all the fun though, so I gave him a head start. I drilled a hole just big enough for the water methanol nozzle to fit and then put this thing in my truck so that I wouldn't forget it tomorrow on my way to work. I didn't forget it. It's done now, or it's mostly done anyway. It's, it's just another step you should be prepared to do. I don't have a TIG welder yet, so I'll just have to rely on the capabilities of others for now. The right way to deal with thin wall aluminum tubing is to weld an eighth inch NPT bung onto it because there's not enough meat for the threads to bite and it'll leak if you don't. It's important not to add a boost leak when you're installing this kit. The reason why I said that it's mostly done is because the depth of the installation for the water injection nozzle is way too shallow, and even if I tap that deeper, the thickness of the bung prevents me from achieving the depth that I need, so I have to grind it down a little bit. I need to make it about half as deep as it currently sits. No problem, I do this kind of stuff all the time here. This is nothing that a grinder, a tap, some files, and some sandpaper can't fix. It's a little bit hard to see without a camera that fits inside the pipe, but the nozzle is situated just below the depth of the wall thickness when the nozzle is just finger tight. I didn't want it mounted too shallow in the hole because of its spray pattern. I don't want it to spray onto the threads and pool inside because the nozzle's mounted on the bottom of the pipe. We'll take a look at that spray pattern a little bit later. Right now I want to go over the nozzle parts though. I think that this is a 40 micron filter. It's there to prevent junk from clogging up the nozzle assembly. It's a serviceable part, meaning that you can take it off and clean it if it ever does get clogged. Be careful not to damage it because it doesn't come with a spare. Inside the filter you'll find a spring and a plunger. This is the proverbial thumb on the garden hose that makes the water pressure exit with velocity. Don't drop and lose these parts because there aren't spares for these either. 
If you look carefully, you'll see that the plunger is fluted on its beveled edge to create a turbulent vortex behind the nozzle to encourage better atomization in front of the nozzle. The check valve assembly is actually in the black section of this part. It's there to ensure that the boost doesn't push your methanol charge back up the hose and into the tank. It comes with the medium-sized nozzle pre-installed in one of the nylon washers where it belongs. The kit includes a section of nozzles for installation applications of up to 600 horsepower. There are parts available beyond what I'll show you in this video to expand this particular kit. The housing has a 5 8 inch hex, the nozzle fittings are 9 16 and the filter assembly is a 7 millimeter. Don't over tighten the filter. The instructions say to only tighten slightly more than finger tight. I'm using the wrench because I have big fingers and I don't want to damage the filter. This is not the latest technology or the most extravagant water methanol injection kit available as far as features are concerned, but it's a practical, well-rounded kit that should be more than enough to give my Turbo Elantra an edge that will carry me well beyond my goals. I'm just going to use the medium nozzle for now, but before I can install the nozzle, I need to install the hose, clean up, and flush out the system. You didn't need to see me put my interior back together, just know that I did it. The water methanol hose is concealed under plastic the entire length of my interior up to the front of the car, and I zip tied it down under the dash where nobody can step on it or kick it. I don't want it to get damaged. For the system flush, I'm just using distilled water because I don't want any of the minerals and chemicals from tap water inside this thing. Let me make sure it's not expired water. Nope, looks like a vintage March 2018 bottling. There's nothing in this water that sustains life, so I don't know how it goes bad. I guess it absorbs stuff. Anyway, it's not tap water, and that probably doesn't matter for just a reservoir flush because it's not getting sprayed into my engine anyway. The location I installed the tank in couldn't have worked out any better. There's plenty of room to tip a full jug of something, and the big mouth on the reservoir makes it hard to spill. There's nothing over here that would be hurt by a spill if I ever did it. The kit weighs a fraction of what my battery used to, but I installed this on the light side of the car here on the opposite side for ballast. This pump is pretty powerful. It moves a lot of water, and it can generate 200 pounds of fluid pressure when restricted. It's important to have something up here to catch the water, or you could have a real mess on your hands real quick. The way I have my water methanol kit wired, I have to have the car running in order for the controller to even turn on, so I can't flush the system with the engine off. It won't even activate the test cycle. Before you install the nozzle, you need to flush any and all debris out of the system first. Any chunks of funk in the reservoir, the pump, or the hose that don't belong there need to be vacated first. Of course, you could just pick that kind of stuff out of the check valve or the nozzle's filter screen later, but wouldn't you rather not? When you press the test button, the pump activates and gradually ramps up to maximum flow. It sprays for a couple of seconds and then it stops. If you're trying to flush the tank, you have to press the button several times to get it drained. 
five second intervals work great if you can't see what you're doing from behind the wheel. It doesn't take long with the nozzle disconnected from the hose to blow through the entire reservoir. Normally the float switch will stop the system from running completely dry and blowing air into the water line, but the test button doesn't care. If the engine's running and you press it, it's going to turn the pump no matter what. Before it's completely drained, let's take a look at that nozzle spray pattern. Off camera, I blew into the hose to see if there was any sort of backflow protection on the pump, and there's not, when, not whenever the pump's not running. That wasn't very smart of me before doing this demonstration. But now that the line is clear of air, you can see how it sprays an ultra-fine smooth mist that slowly falls down in sheets. It's a lot of water. Things are getting soaked up here. When you add heat from compression and high volume airflow velocity across that nozzle, that mist quickly gets smashed into water and alcohol vapor. When mixed 50-50 with methanol, the evaporating water absorbs heat from the intake charge, making it considerably denser, and it leaves methanol vapor behind to stabilize the fuel and raise your octane. The denser air lets you fit more air inside the combustion chamber while also being able to run higher boost levels without risking pre-detonation or knock because of the alcohol vapor. So hopefully with some tuning experiments, this will answer whether or not the knock I've been experiencing is real or fake. I want my timing advance back. Now that the system's completely drained, it should be in fail-safe mode. The error light is blinking both on the controller box and on the dashboard LED with the code 1 for low fluid. This is the condition where I want it to shut down the power and put me in the safe area of my tune. ECM Link uses RPMs and load factor to provide you with the correct airflow adjustments, fuel delivery, and timing advance. Load factor is exactly what it sounds like. It's how much load or resistance you're applying to the crankshaft at any given RPMs. Lots of things can affect load factor, but one of the things that makes the biggest impact with a turbocharged DSM is how much boost you're throwing at it. Boost provides a dramatic impact on load factor. I'm not using the water methanol kit the way it says to use it. If you remember, there's two knobs on the kit. One controls at what boost pressure it starts, and the other controls at what boost pressure it achieves its maximum flow. The way I plan to set the start knob is to turn on when the boost is above wastegate pressure. That means I'll be making adjustments to correct my timing and fuel delivery in any of those tables in the cells that have higher load factors than what my engine achieves at wastegate pressure. There are multiple reasons for this, and I'll tell you about them while we take the car out and get some data and test my failsafe circuit. If the failsafe circuit works, then I should only be at around 10 PSI because the tank is empty and the relay should have the boost control solenoid pin on the ECU switched to the fake boost control solenoid circuit where it's incapable of raising the boost any higher than what my car's wastegate spring and boost creep capabilities can provide it with. All the cells at or below wastegate pressure are already tuned. I spent a while without turning the boost up trying to get those right, and they're in pretty good shape, but at higher pressures and with a 50-50 mix of water and methanol in the tank, the water methanol vapor displaces the volume of some of the air that would normally be in its place. So you're adding fuel with methanol, and you're also displacing some of the air volume with a non-flammable, incompressible water vapor. Also, when water cools the air intake charge, it becomes denser and therefore it's capable of fitting more air into the combustion chamber on each intake stroke. Methanol raises the octane level of the intake charge, letting you get away with more aggressive timing advance because the fuel supply is less likely to pre-ignite. It won't matter if it's my speed density table, my timing tables, or my open loop octane tables. The settings that can cook my engine at high boost levels will be unreachable in the event that boost safe circuit activates my fail safe relay when the bottle runs dry. And I'll be driving in the safe gasoline only portion of my tune at 10 pounds. The reason my fail safe is effective is because all of those tables are based on load factor. It's going to take some work to get that maximum flow knob set correctly for me to make the most of this kit. Just like it's going to take me a while to nail down the right timing, airflow, and fuel tables. But I wanted to give everyone this installation video to help anyone considering a water methanol kit to either buy the expensive fail-safe add-on kit for it, or buy the more expensive comprehensive kit that comes with it, or you could just be like me and buy the cheap relay and use your head like I did to build a fail-safe system that works for my application. The reason I stress this is because if you try to install one of these things without a failsafe, you lean out your tune and you'll run out of juice at high boost and wide open throttle. All the cooling goes away, all the fuel goes away, and that aggressive timing table that worked to make you lots of power with your water methanol kit will suddenly become your worst enemy. Things will get hot and go boom real quick if you have an aggressive timing map and a lean fuel mixture. 
It looks like my failsafe system is working perfectly because I'm at around 10 PSI in failsafe mode. I'm proud of this work enough to call this installation done. I put links to the Wikipedia page for water methanol injection, links to my Patreon account for those interested in supporting my efforts here on YouTube, and of course there's the like, comment, share, and subscribe buttons that Google so thoughtfully placed down there for everyone. Subscribe and ring that bell if you want updates on this and all of my other projects, and until next time, stay tubed!